Biochemistry is the branch of chemistry that studies the chemical substances and processes that happen inside living things. To understand biochemistry in detail, first, we need to know what are biomolecules. Actually, biomolecules are the natural molecules found in living organisms, and they are essential for life. Biomolecules are further divided into four major types of, and they are carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. First, let's explain carbohydrates in detail. Carbohydrates can be defined as organic molecules molecules made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. To understand deeply, we can divide carbohydrates into three main categories based on their size and structure, and they are monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Let's have a clear concept of monosaccharides first. These are the simplest forms of carbohydrates that cannot be broken down into simple sugars. For example, glucose, which has the formula C6H12O6, is a monosaccharide. If we look at its structure, it can exist in two forms, which are a straight chain form and a ring form. Remember that in our body, glucose usually exists in the ring form. Similarly, fructose and galactose are also monosaccharides with the same formula, but different arrangements of their atoms. Now, we will move toward disaccharides. When two monosaccharides join together through a process called dehydration synthesis, they form a disaccharide. Let's take the example of table sugar, which is also known as sucrose. It is formed when glucose and fructose combine together. During this combination, one hydrogen atom from one sugar and one hydroxyl group from another sugar combine to form water, and the two sugars become linked by what we call a glycosidic bond. Actually, a glycosidic bond is a type of chemical bond that connects two sugar molecules or a sugar to another molecule. Similarly, lactose in milk is formed when glucose and galactose combine, while maltose is formed when two glucose molecules join together. Now, let's understand polysaccharides. These are long chains of monosaccharides joined together. For example, starch, which is found in potatoes and rice, is a polysaccharide made up of hundreds of glucose units linked together. Another example is cellulose, which makes up plant cell walls. Interestingly, both starch and cellulose are made of glucose units, but they differ in how these units are linked together. This difference is why we can digest starch, but not cellulose. Now, it's time to explain proteins. Proteins can be defined as large biomolecules made up of amino acid units linked together by peptide bonds. To understand proteins deeply, we need to look at their structural organization, which has four levels. Let's start with the primary structure of proteins. This is simply the sequence of amino acids linked together. For example, insulin, a protein hormone, has a specific sequence of 51 amino acids. Each amino acid has an amino group at one end and a carboxyl group at the other end with a unique side chain that gives it specific properties. When these amino acids link together, the amino group of one amino acid reacts with the carboxyl group of another, forming a peptide bond. Actually, peptide bond can be defined in simple way. It is formed when the carboxyl group of one amino acid reacts with the amino group of another, releasing a water molecule. Now we can move towards secondary structure. The secondary structure forms when parts of the amino acid chain fold into regular patterns. There are two main types, the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. In an alpha helix, the chain twists into a spiral shape, like a spiral staircase. The beta pleated sheet, on the other hand, forms when parts of the chain lie parallel to each other, like a folded paper fan. These structures are held together by hydrogen bonds between different parts of the chain. Moving to the tertiary structure, this is formed when the protein chain folds into a specific three-dimensional shape. Let's take the example of myoglobin, a protein that stores oxygen in muscles. Its single chain folds into a compact globe-like structure, with the folding determined by interactions between the side chains of different amino acids. These interactions include hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and hydrophobic interactions. The quaternary structure occurs when multiple protein chains, each with its own tertiary structure, come together. Hemoglobin is a perfect example. It has four protein chains, two alpha chains, and two beta chains that work together to carry oxygen in our blood. Each chain has its own specific shape, and they all fit together like puzzle pieces to form the functional protein. Now it's time to cover metabolism. To understand what metabolism actually is, let's look at what happens to a piece of bread after we eat it. First, our digestive system breaks it down into simple molecules like glucose. This is a breakdown process. Then, our cells either use this glucose for energy or convert it into fat for storage. This is a building up process. These two opposite processes working together show us what metabolism is all about. Now we can define metabolism in a simple and easy way. Metabolism is the sum of all chemical reactions that occur in living organisms to maintain life. 
These reactions either break down complex molecules into simpler ones or build complex molecules from simple ones. There are two main types of metabolism, and they are catabolism and anabolism. Let's understand both in detail. First, let's explain catabolism. Catabolism can be defined as the breakdown of complex molecules into simple ones with the release of energy. To understand it deeply, let's take the example of glucose breakdown in our cells. When one glucose molecule is broken down through a process called cellular respiration, it produces carbon dioxide, water, and energy in the form of ATP molecules. Since this process breaks down glucose into simple molecules and releases energy, it's a perfect example of a catabolic process. Now we need to move toward anabolism. It can be defined as the building up of complex molecules from simple ones using energy. To make it clear, let's look at protein synthesis in our body. When we eat protein-rich foods, our body breaks them down into amino acids. These amino acids are then used to build new proteins through a process called protein synthesis. This process requires energy in the form of ATP. Since it builds complex proteins from simple amino acids using energy, it's an anabolic process. ATP plays a central role in energy transfer. To make it clear, let's look at its structure. ATP has three parts, and they are an adenine base, a ribose sugar, and three phosphate groups. The key to ATP's energy-carrying ability lies in its phosphate bonds. When the last phosphate group is removed, energy is released, and ATP becomes ADP. This energy release can be compared to a fully charged battery, becoming a partially charged battery. Now, let's explore the role of enzymes in metabolism. Enzymes can be defined as biological catalysts that speed up metabolic reactions without being consumed in the process. To understand how enzymes work, let's take the example of sucrose an enzyme that breaks down sucrose. Sucrose has a special area called the active site where sucrose fits perfectly, like a key in a lock. When sucrose binds to this active site, the enzyme helps break the bond between glucose and fructose much faster than would happen without the enzyme. Moving to metabolic cycles, let's understand them in detail. A metabolic cycle is a series of connected reactions where the final product of one reaction becomes the starting material for the next reaction. To make it clear, let's take the example of the citric acid cycle. This cycle cycle begins with a 2-carbon acetyl group combining with a 4-carbon oxaloacetate to form 6-carbon citric acid. Through a series of reactions, the citric acid loses 2-carbon atoms as CO2 and is converted back to oxaloacetate, ready to start the cycle again. Since this cycle keeps repeating as long as there are starting materials available, it's called a metabolic cycle. Now we can learn what happens within a cell and its structure. To understand what happens inside a cell, let's look at its basic structure. Think of a cell as a busy factory with a special covering called the cell membrane that acts like the factory's walls. Just as a wall protects a factory but allows materials to enter and exit through gates, the cell membrane is made up of a special arrangement of lipid molecules that control what goes in and out of the cell. Now we can define cell membrane in a simple and easy way. The cell membrane is a flexible barrier made up of phospholipids arranged in a bilayer with proteins embedded in it that controls the movement of substances in and out of the cell. Let's explore transport mechanisms in detail. Transport Transport across the cell membrane can happen in two main ways, passive transport and active transport. To understand passive transport deeply, let's take the example of glucose moving into a cell. When there's more glucose outside the cell than inside, glucose molecules naturally move into the cell through special protein channels. This is like water flowing downhill requiring no energy. This type of movement from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration is called diffusion. Now let's move toward active transport. It can be defined as the movement of substances against their concentration gradient, requiring energy in the form of ATP. To make it clear, let's look at the sodium-potassium pump. This protein pump uses ATP energy to push sodium ions out of the cell while pulling potassium ions in, even when these ions want to move in the opposite direction. It's like pushing a heavy box uphill. It needs energy to work against natural forces. Moving to cellular compartments, these are specialized areas within the cell that perform specific functions. Let's understand this with the example of mitochondria, often called the powerhouse of the cell. Just like a power plant in a city, mitochondria have their own unique structure with folded inner membranes called cristae, where energy production takes place. Here, glucose is broken down through cellular respiration to produce ATP molecules. Now, let's explain enzyme function in detail. Enzymes can be defined as biological catalysts that speed up chemical reactions in cells without being changed themselves. 
To understand how enzymes work, we need to look at three important concepts, the lock and key model, active sites, and enzyme kinetics. First, let's have a clear concept of the lock and key model. This model explains how enzymes work with specific substances called substrates. To make it clear, let's take the example of the enzyme sucrose and its substrate sucrose. The enzyme sucrose has a special region called the active site that perfectly fits the shape of sucrose, just like a key fits into a specific lock. When sucrose enters this active site, the enzyme can break it down into glucose and fructose much faster than would happen without the enzyme. Moving to active sites, these are specific regions on the enzyme where the chemical reaction takes place. Let's understand this with the example of pepsin, a digestive enzyme. Pepsin's active site contains specific amino acids arranged in a way that can break the bonds in protein molecules. Molecules. This arrangement is so specific that if we change even one amino acid in the active site, the enzyme might stop working completely. Finally, let's explain enzyme kinetics. This refers to how fast enzymes work under different conditions. To understand it deeply, let's look at what affects enzyme speed. Temperature is one factor. Just like we work best at normal body temperature, enzymes also have an optimal temperature. If it gets too hot or too cold, they slow down or stop working. Similarly, pH affects enzyme speed. For example, pepsin works best in the acidic environment of our stomach, while other enzymes might work better in neutral or basic conditions. 